Steyer and Weissenbach to investigate the inverse problem, pinpointing the user's location given that of the satellite. This led them and APL to develop, to develop the transit system. Transit is the first satellite navigation system. Transit used by the United States Navy, Navy was first successfully tested in 1960. It used a five satellites that could provide a navigational fix approximately once per hour. In 1967, the US Navy developed the Timation satellite. Through the ability to place accurate clocks in space, a technology required by GPS. In 1970, the Pentagon discussed the creation of the Defense Navigation Satellite System. It was, the, it was at this meeting where the synthesis that became GPS was created. Later that year, the DNSS program was named NAVSTAR, a navigation system using timing and rating change. With the individual satellites being associated with the name NAVSTAR as with the present predecessor, <laughs> a more fully encompassing name was used to identify our satellite, meaning Global Positioning System, or GPS. Ten Block 1 prototype satellites were launched in 1978 and 1985. An additional unit was destroyed in a launch failure. One of the key uh, items that was initially addressed, again, very accurate timekeeping is a must, is the relativistic effects. The relativistic effects, fortunately, are bias errors. You will know in engineering that you have two fundamental types of errors, which are bias and which are random. Random errors are measured in and addressed in a statistical fashion. That would have been uh, very difficult if the relativistic uh, errors were in fact uh, random errors. They are in fact uh, bias errors that can be. The special relativity predicts seven microseconds per day, and the general relativity predicts 45 microseconds per day. Onboard atomic clocks take at one nanosecond. A combination of general and special relativity indicates that clocks in the satellite should be faster. And the clock adjustment is in fact there at 38 microseconds per day. Um, the computation is not that simple. The computation actually is done by use uh, precise uh, equations with the Schwarzschild solution to Einstein's field equations. And the exact relation is given in fact on the right. And that those equations are in fact used in the design of the uh, different uh, devices that are either installed in the in the satellite. Even though, again, I still repeat again, you have no control of the, or the rate of of ticking of the clocks in the in the satellite. <laughs> but the corrections on the ground are in fact done, you know, based on the uh, closed form equations uh, shown there to the right. Is differential, second degree differential equations. Okay. Orbital navigation satellite systems development, uh, orbital parameters, uh, orbital or orbits were described a long, long time ago. And that was before my time, too, by Kepler in the 1570s to 1730. That is not correct. It's 1571 to 1630. He did not leave it under 50 years. Uh, he was a mathematician uh, in those days. Uh, there's not many things that people can do, but it's very, very astonishing how they progressed and how they analyzed and enunciated the orbital parameters. The orbital parameters at the semi-major axis, which is the distance from one edge to the center of the ellipse, the eccentricity E, a measure of how much the ellipse deviates from the circle, the inclination, and the angle of the ellipse relative to the equatorial plane at the ascending node, and the right ascension of the ascending node, which describes the point on the equator where the ascending node occurs. 
the argument of perigee, angle of the ellipsis semi-major axis relative to the equatorial plane, is measured at the focus of the ellipse where the Earth is centered. The epoch is a reference time when the satellite's orbit and location are specified. And the anomaly in two forms, true anomaly and eccentric anomaly, describes the satellite position as an epoch. These things are illustrated in these figures where we show the eccentricity, and it's basically like squashing and ellipse down. The orbital inclination is uh, very simple, it shows the uh, Earth's uh, rotation at the equator and the inclination, the orbital inclination from the equator. Now, eccentric and true anomaly is uh, um, a bit more, uh, you know, uh, convoluted, a bit more complex to, to explain. But this shows, in fact, the relation between the focus of the ellipse, the two focuses. Uh, Pochi, I should say, properly speaking. Uh, the orbital ellipse and an auxiliary circle, which is where the satellite actually will be found. <coughs> and the ascending node is the, uh, again, the longitude of the ascending node will be at this uh, critical item here, because that's where the, uh, the argument of theory abscess, in fact, is going to be computed. Now, satellite orbits are classified by the satellite altitude. And uh, now the, the Earth is only approximately spherical, certainly not spherical. So no single value serves as its natural radius. Now, the Earth's radius range from 63 to 53 kilometers. And the mean radius that is usually used is 6371. Now, the three orbits are classified by distance, the distance from the Earth's surface which, as I said, could be a bit more complex, and the distance from the Earth's center, which uh, remains constant. And the high Earth orbit uh, goes up to uh, 42,151 kilometers. The medium Earth orbit, it goes between 2,000 and 35,000 kilometers. And the lower Earth orbit is between 180 kilometers to 2,000 kilometers. Now, a geosynchronous orbit is called geostationary orbit. It's a special case of a high Earth orbit. The altitude exactly at 4,000 kilometers from the Earth center, and the orbit matches the Earth rotation. Because the satellite orbits at the same speed, because the satellite orbits, meaning moves, at the same speed that the Earth is turning, the satellite seems to stay in place over a single longitude, though it may drift north or to south. A satellite in a circular geosynchronous orbit directly over the, equa the equator, eccentricity and inclination of zero, will have a geostationary orbit that does not move at all relative to the ground. It is always directly over the same place on the Earth. As you can see, the specific orbit is one critical element in so far assigning a satellite navigation system. You have a number of uh, sweet spots, and uh, this is an interesting thing that well, again, was discovered many, many years ago. And uh, they, they're called the Lagrange points. At the Lagrange points, the pull of gravity from the Earth cancels out the pull of gravity from the Sun. Anything placed at these points will feel equally full towards the Earth and the Sun and will revolve with the Earth around the Sun. The three collinear Lagrange points, L1, L2, and L3, were discovered in Leonard Euler a few years before Lagrange discovered them, discovered them remain, the, the remaining two. Uh, to make a long story short, you can see that the Points are points. Uh, the L1, L2, and L3 is unstable. In the satellite, we'd actually move. And uh, once it moves, it will remain in the new place. The L4 and L5, it looks like a ball on a, you know, on a container that, that is curved. So if it moves, it will go back to the original place. That's a point of interest, actually. Uh, 
but it's not uh, uh, critical for our uh, for our presentation. In any case, if you have the location of the points, like most things uh, in engineering, can be found exactly by a solution of specific equations, which I give here: balancing gravitation and centrifugal force. And the value of our group is certainly different uh, than L1. Okay, medium Earth orbit, uh, and this is the orbit of the GPS uh, satellites. It's a semi-synchronous orbit, which is nearly a circular orbit of low eccentricity. A satellite at this height takes 12 hours to complete an orbit. That was a key, key point when the system was designed. As the satellite moves, the Earth rotates on it. In 24 hours, the satellite crosses over the same two spots on the equator every day. This orbit is consistent and highly predictable. And of this, the orbit, as I mentioned in the title, is used by the GPS satellites. The Molnaya orbit was invented by the Russians, and the Molnaya orbit works well for observing high altitudes. The geostationary orbit is valuable for the constant view it provides. Satellites in a geostationary orbit are part of the equator, so they don't work well for far northern and southern locations, which are always on the edge of, of view for the geostationary satellites. However, the Molnaya orbit is an alternative uh, that some people have used, uh, the Russian thing. The low Earth orbit, the most scientific satellites and many weather satellites are in a nearly circular low Earth orbit. The satellite's inclination depends on what the satellite was launched to monitor. During one half of the orbit, the satellite is inside of the Earth. At the pole, the satellite crosses over to the nighttime side of the Earth. Many of the satellites in NASA's Earth observing system have a nearly polar orbit. In this highly inclined orbit, the satellite moves around the Earth from pole to pole, taking about 99 minutes to complete the orbit. In global navigation satellite systems, a medium Earth orbit was chosen. Why? Because it allows more Earth to be visible. In a 12 hour orbit, 76% coverage at 20,194 kilometers, as opposed to 8 hour orbit and a six-hour orbit at the different altitudes, 13 and 10,000. The satellite velocity at 22,300 kilometers, the horizon to horizon time gives a 12-hour orbit of 4.5 hours, an eight-hour orbit of 2.7 hours, and a six-hour orbit of 1.9 hours. The one-way communication radio frequency links radiate towards the Earth and no northern communication. That's a very critical point. The uh, satellites do not receive, except for control signals, do not receive signals from the uh, locating units. Orbital period is one half the Earth mean side the real day, which is 23 hours, 56 minutes and 4.0916 seconds and keeps the longitude of the ascending node within plus minus two degrees, which enables ground track repeatability. Again, uh, low Earth orbits are suitable for two-way communications. There was a system that was deployed in which I had some part, uh, we had part in a lot of these things, but the Iridium was uh, conceived, that was the Motorola Electronics uh, Division, in uh, uh, Phoenix, outside of Tempe, Arizona. And it requires 77, and it was called Iridium because the atomic number of Iridium is 77, even though the satellites have nothing to do with the, with nuclear you know, power. And the deployed system is 66 satellites. At this point, it's different. The company was sold, uh, it's now in private hands, and uh, still doing some form of, uh, of work. Now we're going to now go now to geolocation methods. 
the triangulation. You can see the mass on the right hand side. And the interesting thing is that the Talus of Mileto in the 6th century BC is recorded as using similar triangles to estimate the height of the pyramids by measuring the length of their shades or the shadows. And that, uh, and that will be shown at the moment and comparing the ratios to, to the ratios to his height. You see how the observer co coordinates and that's uh, geometry, basic geometry. You know, x plus t times cosine and y plus t sine. The angles to the two points are and beta are known. And then trace the two lines from the server to the two points. Then find the intersection of the two lines. This is a critical point. When you do location of any kind, the intersection of the geometric figures is what's going to give you the location. Hyperbolic location systems, uh, as I said, is used mostly for uh, electronic warfare, signals intelligence, even though some uh, civilian systems have tried or are using it. And you can see on the graphic at the right, uh, the point uh, of the intersection of the hyperbolas, L1 and L2, is what is going to give you the location of the item. This system, of course, has an ambiguity, which is two locations, and it has to resolve it. The re resolution usually it comes from uh, uh, common sense, basically, where is the signal coming from? Now, that sometimes does not work. Here it was a bit too cumbersome, so I chose to, to go ahead with the two dimensions for the example. And the cell phone is in view of at least three towers or towers and satellites. The circle's radius are the measured distances from the tower to the cell phone. Or from the satellite to the same cell phone. And to find the location, there could be a solution of simultaneous uh, nonlinear equations. Now, these computations are done in real time. This is an example that, uh, that I have with a mathematical computation software called MathCAD. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's a very useful uh, software as opposed to MATLAB where you can actually write equations in uh, closed form as opposed to in programming language. What you see here, A, B, C, D, and E, and the X and Y solution are in fact uh, taken straight from the MATLAB sheet. In this example, we have coordinates X and Y, which see arbitrarily 600, 1600, 800. The cell position, an arbitrary point in the Cartesian coordinate plane, and these are coordinates that you have to find. Now, in real systems, at that long, the real latitude and longitude are numerically encoded. So you can actually do the computations. Uh, T1 is a tower one location. I give the arbitrary numbers 800, 2200. Uh, those, in fact, are meters from the uh, from the center. The tower two location and tower three location, and the system of equations is given uh, subsequently. Uh, now, the, if you all remember the basic algebra, the equations that we have are, you know, two sets of equations: uh, dy equals c, dx plus dy equals f. And the coefficients are, in fact, stated in terms of the radius and their coordinates there. And as you all remember, uh, some of you remember, there is a matrix solution. In the real-time real system, there are now uh, more efficient ways of computing the solutions of a, a system of, of equations. And those are applied. That certainly could be a subject of an entire talk. And some uh, methods are more prone, are more suitable for the electronics, you know, microelectronics. Now, this in fact is plotted with the math card. You can see how the circles uh, intersect at one point and at one point only. And the error on there, which is in fact a statistical measure, I'm going to go uh, a bit more to that. And that's the red circle that uh, goes through the intersection point. Uh, 
The next thing we're going to address is accuracy versus precision. And we have four cases here where the true values represented by the blue square in the center of those circles. Baby, you need to just the just first uh, circle, the upper left circle, is neither accurate nor precise. The location appears all over the place. The second one uh, could be spheric effects. Uh, Ionospheric can be due to very small or very large. When the satellite is near the observer's horizon, the vernal equinox is near, and the sun, sunspot activity is near. For example, the T6 maximized during the peak of an 11 year solar cycle. This uh, system varies with the magnetic activity and time of day, and the different frequencies are affected differently. Another consequence of the dispersive nature of the ionosphere is the apparent time delay for a higher frequency carry wave, it is for a lower frequency wave. In L1, which is one of the transmission um, frequencies of GPS, it's not affected as much as in L2 at 12.7.6 megahertz. And L2 is not affected as much as L5, which is 1176.45 megahertz. In multiple, multiple frequency receivers, which are on the market now, by tracking all the carriers, a multiple frequency receiver can model a significant portion of the atmospheric bias. Now, separations between frequencies are large enough to facilitate estimation of the ionospheric group delay. Group delay, again, is a phenomenon and they are very frequency receivers. And it's one of the key considerations in designing, you know, a radio frequency receiver. Doppler, Doppler effects. Okay. What happens if GPS goes away? There is a lot of speculation about uh, what happens. A lot of questions are being asked. Uh, the uh, US Defense Department, of course, has been addressing that very, very thoroughly. And uh, however, some of these uh, conversations have, were made public. And the one I'm reproducing here is from the Draper Labs. And he stated in fact last year that there will not be a single substitute. There will be a need for multiple solutions or operating at the same time. I don't have to make a clarification here. If you go to a, something that has been uh, mentioned many times, the detonation of nuclear uh, weapons, of very high power nuclear weapons over the atmosphere, will eliminate all radio wave pro propagation. In that case, uh, substitutes are not going to work. However, the Pentagon is spending tens of billions of dollars on a new constellation of more secure GPS satellites. Stronger anti jump signal in anticipation for a future conflict. But even as the military is counting on a modernized GPS to be more resilient to electronic atta attacks, it is eyeing alternative yet vital positioning, navigation, and time data just in the case GPS is denied. Draper has made non GPS navigation and timing a central part of his business. And in addition to celestial, celestial tracking technology, he just developed inertial navigation systems, precision time transfer using optics and chip scale, a transition based navigation that relies on cell phone cameras <coughs> and signal processing algorithms. Each one of those points is a lecture in itself. Uh, the Charles Stark Draper Laboratory is an American not for profit research and development organization headquartered in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. The expertise of the laboratory staff includes the areas of guidance, navigation, and control, advanced algorithms and software, modeling and simulation, and microelectromechanical systems on multiple multi chip module technology. Is of course a spin-off of MIT, 
Charles Stark Draper, you know, was uh, working at that point in, at MIT. Now, here we have a number of uh, global navigation satellite systems. The characteristics of GPS, the GLONASS is in fact a Russian satellite system, Galileo is European satellite system, and Beidou is the Chinese satellite system. At this point, there is another satellite system uh, put up by India, the country of India, which uh, fell off the chart here. Uh, the characteristics are very similar. I do have to add now that the, uh, yes, I state here, the, there are dual receivers that work GNSS and GLONASS jointly. The Russian system and the US GNSS, uh, GPS receiver, they're dual receivers. Uh, the position of such the system is operational, you'll know that because you probably have one in, in your car. And each orbit contains four satellites. The signaling system is L1, with the frequency one is 1575.42 megahertz. It's a binary phase shift scheme modulated by use of random codes. CA is a course acquisition, and P code is a precision acquisition. The when the initially when initially was created, GPS has two forms: the course acquisition code and the precision code. The precision code is accessed through, in fact, uh, an encrypted uh, link, and was designed all, only for use by the military. That uh, distinction was not eliminated, and the GPS that you use uh, gives a substantially good act. It's not uh, distorted anymore. The Russian Republic, the GLONASS system is very similar. Uh, frequencies are, of course, different. And uh, the GLONASS does not use any type of selected availability. Galileo, in European fact, uh, under development, at this point, it is deployed, actually. The I don't have the full uh, data on the on the Galileo. And the Compass, the Radio China, is again under development at this point. There are some sub that many satellites that was in fact uh, deployed. And uh, the plan was in fact uh, that it should be deployed in 2020. So both systems, the Galileo and the Compass, the Baidu, Beidou, how do you pronounce that? It uh, should become available, fully available, towards the end of 2020. They are, for the most part, on track. And India NSS is planned development constellation of seven satellites. In the interest of time, I'm going to go a bit fast on this uh, later chart. Uh, but uh, the GPS is shown and is available for general use around the world. We have 21 GPS satellites and two spare satellites. They're in medium orbit and they're spaced so that uh, from any point on Earth, four satellites will be above the horizon. Again, remember, four, four satellites is what you need to compute a longitude. The example I gave, you need three towers to compute an actual location in two dimension. You need uh, four satellites or towers to give the location in in a plane and in altitude as well. So that you have an intersection of uh, spheres that will give you the location. Each satellite contains a computer and atomic and continuous broadcast. Once a day, each satellite checks its own sense of time and position with the ground station and makes any minor corrections that are required. <clears throat> On the ground, the receiver computes its own position by getting bearings from three of the four satellites. The result is provided in the form of geographic position, again, two dimensions, for most receivers uh, within a thousand, a hundred meters. 
Big in the accuracy, it's a lot, lot better than 100 meters. If the receiver is also equipped with a display, the screen shows a map, of course, you have that in your car. If a fourth satellite can be received, the receiver computes to figure out the altitude as well as the ge geographic position. If you're moving, your receiver may also be able to calculate your speed and direction of travel and give you estimated times for arrival to specify destinations. That is a very common usage nowadays. Most cars do have that facility. This is the evolution of the GPS. Uh, it started with Block 2A, uh, Block 2R, or Block 2RM, going to GPS 3, which is now in production. And launched in 2016, we're beyond that at this point. Uh, the companies that manufactured that, uh, some of these elements was IPT defense, where if to work the uh, now it's carriers actually that has a contract to manufacture the actual you know uh, GPS units. Now something that is not uh, well known is that all satellite systems, for whatever purpose, they usually have the control segment. The control segment has uh, send signals, monitor the position, make sure that everything is okay, checks the clocks, and uh, that's all the myriad of things that you need to do with any kind of system, certainly an electronic system. And here you can see a uh, control station it is in Schreiber, Schreiber actually, airport facing code, uh, where you have ground antennas in Cape Canaveral, uh, the Air Force Monitoring Station, uh, Alternate Master Control Station, which is that we needed, and the NGA Monitor Station. Again, I uh, said this, uh, the original GPS contains a clear acquisition code. And um, the CA code is 1023 bits long, also pseudo random binary sequence, which when transmitted at 2023, uh, repeats every millisecond. These sequences only match up or strongly correlated when they're exactly aligned. All of you who know about spread spectrum signals, and I looked up some pictures of, uh, you can see how the uh, the signal itself forms, a, you know, a vertical, you know, the power spectrum. The peak code of PRN, however, each satellite's peak code is, uh, you know, six, uh, 10 to the 12 bits long. Peak. <clears throat> it is transmitted at 10.23 megabits. The extreme length of the peak code increases its correlation gain and eliminates any range ambiguity. The code is so long and complex, it was believed that the receiver could not directly acquire and synchronize with the signal alone. Again, we're talking about the days before the explosion in the advance in microelectronics. Nowadays, that can be done, and that can be done with even a battery-powered uh, system. The CA PRNs are unique for each satellite. The peak code is actually a small segment of the master peak code. Each satellite repeatedly transmits its assigned, its, its assigned segment of the master code. Now, to prevent uh, unauthorized users from using or potentially interfering with the military signal through a process called spoofing, it was decided to encrypt the P code. To that end, the P code was modulated with the W code, a special encryption sequence to generate the, the encrypted signal is referred to as a PY code. The details of the W code are secret, but it is known that it is applied to the P code at approximately 500 kilohertz. This is a, a slower rate than that of the P code itself of, appro of approximately 20. Uh, I want to end, end the comment there. <clears throat> now, the differential GPS uh, is used to increase the receiver's location accuracy. 
Differential GPS was originally created to help overcome the error caused by receiver availability in the receiver measurement. Although a selective availability has ended, differential GPS is still used because its purpose of diminishing error usage. The differential GPS enabled receiver receives data from the surface as well as signal correction data from local GPS stations. Differential GPS enabled, receiver, enabled receivers are most commonly found in planes, but they are slowly becoming more common as prices continue to drop. It works by using stationary GPS locations all around the world. These GPS receivers continually calculate their own position based on information received by the satellites. The difference between the two allows these receivers to compute the error. This information is then passed along to differential GPS and using this information, your GPS receiver can. In addition to the PRN loads, a receiver needs to know detailed information about each satellite position in the network. GPS has this information modulated on top of both the CA and the wire ranging coil codes at 50 bits per second, and it is called the navigation message. The navigation message format described here is called the L now data for legacy navigation. The navigation message conveys information which can be classified in three broad areas. The date and time, plus the satellite status and an indication of health. The ephemeris, ephemeris actually, orbital information, which allows a receiver to calculate the position of the satellite. Each satellite transmits its own ephemeris. And the almanac data contains information and status concerning all the satellites. Each satellite transmits almanac data for several, possibly all satellites, depending on which PNN numbers are in use. A position fix using any satellite cannot be calculated until the receiver has an accurate and complete copy of the satellite's ephemeris data. The navigation message consists of 1500 bit long frames. The subframe one contains the GPS date, week number, and information to correct the satellite's time. Subframes two and three together contain the transmitting satellite's ephemeral state. Subframes four and five contain components of the almanac, but each frame contains only 125th of the complete almanac. The frame format uh, of the GPS message is given here. Each word includes six bits of parity. <coughs> yes. So this, uh, at the start, at the start end of week plus an integer multiple of 30 seconds. At start end of the week, the cycling between pages is reset. Page one. There are two navigation message types. L now L is used by satellites with PRN numbers 1 to 32, called lower PRN numbers. L now U is used by satellites with PRN numbers 33 to 63, called the upper numbers. The two types use a very similar format. Subframe 1 to 3 are the same, while subframe 4 and 5 is almost the same format. Both message data for all satellites using the same navigation message type, but not the other type. It begins with a telemetry word. This enables the receiver to detect the beginning of say, the subframe and determine the receiver clock time at which the navigation subframe begins. And the picture of the, sub, the frames and the subframes is given here. Um, each word includes six bits of parity, of course. Uh, to check the correction and generated using an algorithm based on Hamming codes, Hamming error uh, detection and correction codes, which take into account the 24 non parity bits of that frame and the last two bits of the previous word. After a subframe has been read and intercepted, the time the next subframe was sent can be calculated through the use of the clock correction data and the handover word. 
Now, the two line elements that uh, I'm not going to go in detail uh, through this is a format that was established as a standard to describe satellite orbits. That's uh, for every satellite that is flying for whatever purpose at this point does have a two line element set, which is in fact, uh, which contains the following information. The reason for this history uh, <coughs> of this goes to the days where uh, we have uh, we had uh, punch cards again. Some of you can remember that uh, for systems and inertial navigation and integration. They're both very good books, and uh, there are certainly hundreds of references. But that's those are the books that I've, um, I find the most useful, useful. This concludes my presentation today.